Welcome everyone to our weekday text gathering in the middle of all that we are collectively experiencing right now. As we were just saying, it's so nice to have this space to connect and to study together. Yesterday was pretty heavy on housekeeping, so today I'm just going to say that if you have questions, please be sure to put them in the Q&A box. If you have comments, please be sure to put them in the chat. As a reminder, you can find the recordings and the access link to these gatherings at circleofa.org forward slash text gathering. Please feel free to use that link to invite anyone else, other core students who would benefit from joining in this way. Once again, these gatherings are free and open to all, and we will continue to do them every weekday at 10 a.m. Eastern until things calm down a bit. Today is day 86. We'll be covering paragraphs one through nine of chapter five, section six, the ego's use of guilt in the CE. It is on page 214. As I believe Robert mentioned yesterday, the course's section was the first real discussion of guilt. And today, as is so common in the course, we are given a completely new way of looking at the topic of guilt. So to begin, before I turn it over to Robert, wherever you are in the world, I invite you to take a deep breath with me and bow your heads for a prayer. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to come together today as loving friends and mighty companions on this remarkable path of light. We surrender this gathering to you and we ask that it serve your purposes and be blessed by you. May our mind be filled with your thoughts, may our hearts be filled with your love and may our hands be filled with your service. Remove in us any blocks to the awareness of your presence and lead us to the highest vision of ourselves and each other. Dear God, may we use this time of great challenge to remind us of our truth and our dependence on each other and thus plant within us the seeds of a new world, a world reborn with grace, because we have used this time to awaken into the more peaceful and loving beings. May we be a source of miracles and healing within this group and within the world. And so it is. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I have a handout again today. Let me go ahead and share that. This section and the section we looked at yesterday are really the introduction, the full introduction of guilt into the course. Uh, it will then get laid aside, that topic, largely until chapter 13, in which case it comes again back in really strongly. I just thought that what we might cover today, we can't cover a whole section or even nine paragraphs of a section uh, in such a short class. So I thought what we might cover is just what's said about guilt in this section. What is the picture of guilt we get from this? So I have uh, just seven points to cover, not a whole lot. The diagram up top is kind of a summary of the whole thing. And as Emily said, this is giving us a new way to look at guilt. And at the end, I'll try to wrap that up into a sort of nice little package. First of all, what is guilt? This is the definition of guilt that I like to use. is the feeling that you've done something bad and therefore deserve bad because you are bad. It's like you've corrupted your very identity. It now is something bad. And because of that, because of what you've done, you deserve bad to, to come to you. Okay. So I'm gonna skip the diagram for the time being and just dive right into the points. As Emily said, if you have questions, just put them in the Q&A feature there. And we're, we'll take questions about the course in general, of course, as well. First point, 
Guilt leads to fear of punishment. Now, that's something the chorus emphasizes and assumes throughout, but it was right in the definition, really, implicitly, the feeling that you have done something bad and therefore deserve bad. Well, that's the, uh, that means you've got bad coming to you. And what can that lead to but fear? And the bad that you have coming to you, obviously, is, you know, is punishment. It's your just desserts. So when you feel guilty, you are going to be afraid of what you have coming to you. In paragraph six of this section, he says the classic picture of fear of retaliation from without then follows because the severity of the guilt is so acute that it must be projected. So when you're feeling guilt, you will project that outward. In, in this case, what that means is that you will see a world and behind that a God that believes in your guilt. Okay, God doesn't believe in your guilt, but through projection, it looks like he does. So now you're gonna see God working through the people and the calamities and the viruses of this world to get you your just desserts, but that's all your projection. So guilt leads to fear of punishment. Number two, this section starts out by saying the ego has a purpose for guilt, a use for guilt. The quote says, perhaps this will become clearer and more personally meaningful if the ego's use of guilt is clarified. The ego has a purpose, just as the Holy Spirit has. The ego's purpose is fear because only the fearful can be egotistic. So there's a, there's a kind of a sequence here. The ego wants you to feel guilty because it wants you to be afraid. And our first point was that guilt leads to fear. And why does it want you to be afraid? Because only the fearful can be egotistic. When you're in a state of fear, you get egotistical, you get egocentric right? Your, your concern collapses down onto just you and you feel justified in doing whatever that separate you has to do to stay safe. So the second point is the ego's purpose for guilt is to make us afraid because fear promotes being egotistical. In other words, guilt ends up reinforcing the ego. So when you're feeling guilty, I mean, are you, you should be thinking this way. Like, okay, there's a, there's a motive in me for feeling guilty. It's so that I can be afraid, so that I can be egotistical, so that my ego can be reinforced and strengthened. There's, there's a plan behind the guilt. It's not just an innocent reaction. Number three, by engendering fear, Guilt is divisive. It divides us from others and God. And the quote says, anything that engenders fear is divisive because it obeys the law of division. <clears throat> so are we thinking that, that when we feel guilt, that will make us afraid and that will end up causing us to be divisive? will feel split off from others and from God and, and antagonistic towards them. Because when you're afraid, you're just in survival mode, right? And you see potential enemies everywhere. Number four, whenever you respond to your ego, sorry, it should be say, it should say you, it's a typo. You will, experience guilt, and you will fear punishment. We tend to think, well, we experience guilt specifically at times when we've done something hurtful or cruel even. This is not disagreeing with that. It's just widening it to include any time you respond from your ego. And the section tomorrow's second half of the section 
will essentially expand on that, saying whenever you are thinking based on the ego, you experience guilt. So guilt is a much more continuous thing than we tend to think. Whenever we're responding from our ego, thinking from our ego, doing anything that's ego-based, and that's, you know, 98% of the time. Guilt naturally goes along with that, and then, of course, fear comes along with that. So we tend to think we're periodically feeling guilt. We are feeling guilt, and we're producing new guilt feelings all the time. We just aren't aware of it. We don't like that to be permitted into consciousness, really. Number five, all guilt ultimately stems from the belief we have attacked God, meaning by separating from him. Paragraph three says, guilt is more than merely not of God. It is the symbol of the attack on God. This is the belief from which all guilt really stems. I think this is one of those things that course students tend to know is a teaching of the course. I mean, in certain, you know, sectors of, of the course community, this is front and center. People are very aware that all of our guilt ultimately stems from the separation. It doesn't mean that we aren't feeling guilty for things going on, choices we're making today, because the previous point was all about that right? We're producing guilt by our thinking, by our actions throughout the day. But ultimately, it all stems from separating from God so that the little things that produce guilt throughout the day, they're kind of echoes or symbols of the original separation, which is the real source, the ultimate source of guilt. What that brings up for me is the idea that I must have felt so close to God, so much like I was part of him, he was part of me, he was the most near, dear parent one could possibly ask for, that leaving him in the separation produced colossal guilt so colossal that any guilt I experience now is just a little distant echo of that ultimate guilt. Now, we aren't generally conscious of this guilt. The Course says it happened so long ago that there's no way to remember it. It's beyond the possibility of remembering. But the guilt from that we still carry. And, you know, our ego is kind of sitting, our, our human psyche is sitting on top of that guilt. Number six, attacking God is so impossible that to the sane mind, it is a ridiculous idea. The quote says, and however ridiculous the idea of attacking God may, may be to the sane mind, never forget that the ego is not sane. So we're feeling guilty for something that to a sane mind is ridiculous. All of our guilt is based on something that could never happen. The very notion that it could happen is ridiculous. And that means, of course, that, that none of our guilt has any basis. Okay, and finally, in heaven, there is no guilt. Heaven is a state in which guilt is literally impossible. You can't feel bad about yourself, even to the tiniest degree in heaven. So what does all that add up to? I think it's pretty simple. First of all, he's talking about the source and the effect of guilt. The source is separation from God. That's what ultimately produces our guilt. And then what guilt leads to is fear, which reinforces the ego. What that brought up for me, which I think the the section's really saying in different roundabout ways, is guilt ultimately has no basis because separation from God is impossible. And guilt leads to destructive 
effects, right? It just makes us afraid and being afraid is a very unpleasant thing. And then being afraid makes us egotistical, makes us egocentric, okay? Makes us basically attack for the sake of our ego so that we can feel safe. And don't we even, don't we even turn to that as an excuse, right? We say, well, you know, as a good course student, I know the only reason I attacked was I was just afraid. You know, I just felt fear. And what's really going on is the ego saying, yes, my plan worked because I wanted you to feel guilty so that you would feel fear, so that you'd have an excuse to attack. And then the attack leads to more guilt, being a kind of distant echo of the separation, which leads to more, more fear, and we just stay in this cycle forever. And then, Robert, don't you also think that even though we are trying to justify our attack by saying, oh, I was just afraid, somewhere mixed in there, too, is your definition of guilt. Like, we, we feel like, even though we're trying to justify our behavior, something in us is... is understanding that it was unloving and it was bad. And then we're trying to make judgments on ourselves as being bad as a result. So it's just this soup that starts to stir. And then we continue to behave in those egotistic ways as a result. Yeah. I mean, I think there's kind of a, a split off thing that happens where we say, well, I was just afraid. Therefore I was innocent. I couldn't help it. And then some other part of our we mind know. is saying you're bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know both that we've, are... we've behaved unloving and therefore the guilt comes in from that perspective as well. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, the, the, the big upshot of this really simply is that we think of guilt as just this almost unavoidable reaction to having done something bad. There's no like motive behind it. It's just we did something bad that provides us with a sound reason to feel guilty, a reason that's so sound that the guilt seems like we can't escape it. And that's just it. But we're being given this picture here where it's a lot more complicated than that. First of all, there is no basis really for the guilt. It's based on separation from God, which is a ridiculous notion, could never happen. Further, the guilt has an ulterior motive which is to make us afraid so that we have reason to be egotistical, to punch our way through life and then just say, well, I was afraid. What else could I do? Mm -hmm. And then the ego is reinforced. So there's a, whole, there's a whole picture here that's very different from our usual picture of, well, you know, I have reason to feel guilty. End of story. No, it's you have no reason and your ego has an ulterior motive. So Robert, two things, and then we have some questions. Yeah. One is in paragraph three, where it says guilt is more than merely not of God. It is the symbol of the attack on God. I know you touched on this, but I think it bears a bit more um, discussion. So if, if everyday guilt is an echo of the ultimate source of guilt, which is our separation from God, how can we be connected to that? I mean, we, we feel guilty for all kinds of things. Um, we feel guilty for being unloving. We feel guilty for overeating, as you and I were discussing yesterday. We feel guilt. My kids are over here and two ball day, and I feel guilty that I'm not able to homeschool them during this time. There's all kinds of ways in which we build up guilt, and none of them are in our conscious awareness associated with the separation of God. So what do we do with that teaching? Do we just, where do we go with it? Well, I think one thing that, one, one place we go is we just say, because separation from God's impossible, my guilt has no ultimate basis. That being said, the main way the Course wants us to target guilt is is by addressing the more immediate everyday this world causes you know really having to do with with undoing as we looked at yesterday undoing the things in us that cause us to think and act unlovingly towards others so the course is mainly targeting it on that very surface level but it's also partly targeting it by saying 
he feel guilty for separating from God? And you, you couldn't do that. Okay. And you, you also said that, well, the Course says that the ego wants you to feel guilty because it just wants you to be afraid. It wants you to, to live in this perpetual state of fear so that you behave in, in ways that reflect its goals of attack. So how, how do we map that onto our experience today where it seems like we're bombarded with the fear of the external world? And I mean, I, I'm just an observation of just reading the news. Some of it is giving us information and facts, but some of it's just designed to exploit our fear. And so how, how do we deal with that? Um, how do we deal with that fear in the world today because obviously it's very very heightened yeah well the course is full of ways of dealing with fear there's all kinds of practices in the course for for dealing with fear one thing we could do i mean we can take any idea in the course and really help use it to help us with our fear and one thing we could do with with this idea is say yeah i know there are facts I know that my body, for instance, is, you know, at risk of getting a very dangerous virus. However, we could say those facts could stay exactly as they are, and I would never experience fear because of them unless I already felt guilty. It's my guilt that's getting projected and producing my fear. It's not the facts that are producing my fear. Isn't it liberating to know that the ego wants you to feel fear? And so if you can sort of step outside of it from that perspective and see it for, for what it's trying to do, then you have some freedom from it. Okay, so we're yeah. running out of time. Uh, yeah. Pam, okay. Pam asks, is anxiety a form of guilt? Anxiety is a form of fear. It's kind of low-level, non-specific fear. So yeah, anxiety would be a result of guilt. Yeah, so someone, someone's saying something similar to what I was saying before. It seems my guilt objection that the world is scary and will punish me unless I try and maintain some kind of control of the world and then I have an excuse to not rely on my guidance from the Holy Spirit. Yes. Mm, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. all of that. And we yeah. talked about that yesterday. If you haven't seen the recording, I highly recommend that you watch it. Wait. I think we talked about, well, in, in, in oh, we this, talked about in the text class. That was in the, the course every, companions yeah. text class. Yeah. Sorry. That was in the course companions text class. I'm getting yeah. my classes confused. Yeah. Um, join course companions and you can listen to that class. Uh, Robert is Mike only one thing or some things in my mind. I'm not sure I understand. You broke up for a second there. Uh, it says, Robert, is my guilt only one thing or, or multiple things in my mind? I'm not quite sure. Well, I think we feel guilt on a more, you know, surface level for many, many thousands of reasons. So you could say, well, it's all one thing, and it ultimately stems from one thing, but we see it as having countless causes. So... Carolina, or, or I think it's Carolina, um, or Carolina, Carolina. So one thing in the air is that this fire caused because we humans have done bad and this is the punishment of God. That's usually in the air when some big catastrophic thing happens in the world. And do you it's always in the air. want to address it from a course perspective? Well, from a course, the course says that, that we all look at the world and we conclude whoever's in charge designed this place to punish us for our sins because it, it is constantly punishing us. And so we built the world kind of with that message in mind that we would look at the world and say, I guess we're just being punished for our sins. And what the Course is saying is, no, we dreamt the world and designed it to punish us for our sense of guilt, a sense of guilt that ultimately is baseless. But by designing a world that punishes us, it seems to reinforce the fact that we must really be guilty. So yeah, the Course would never say something is coming to us as an actual punishment, but there's a sense in which we've designed it as a self-punishment to confirm a guilt that we don't really have. 
Sheila asked what day the course companions classes are. They're Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, workbook on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern and text is Wednesdays at um, 11 a.m. Eastern. Liana says, light bulb moment, of course. I have been viewing God as a God who recognizes guilt, but he's not like that at all. Thus, that makes me fear God and wanting to run and hide from him. So um, yeah, that's her relationship with God. Sure. And it's so natural to think of God like other beings we know. Mm -hmm. But we have to open our mind to the idea of a being, a limitless, formless being who works along totally different lines and has no comprehension of guilt and is just pure love. And I, I know I, I know we don't have time to get into this too much, but you have a, a good stage process with God where we go from the traditional wrathful God who issue for doing wrong. He's personified by anger um, at, to the spiritual God. We tend to want to make God more of an energy because we impersonalize him. Because yeah. We, Impersonal. yeah, we impersonalize him because it's easier to um, feel like if he's away from us, then we, we, we use impersonalizing impersonal to push him away. And then there's the, the what we learn from about God in the course is just this unconditionally loving being who wants to have a relationship with us. And that is quite a journey to take as a, as a seeker, but we do have so much of that. So much, so many of us are stuck in that traditional version of God where we're afraid of him and he will punish us. And so I that think gets we're all stuck there. Future. I think we're all stuck there to some degree. The course would say on an unconscious level, everyone's stuck there. Um, on the other hand, I think most spiritual seekers, most students of the course have moved on to more or less the impersonal God, a God who is safe because he's not really a being. He's just some kind of presence, suchness, beingness, ground of being, energy. Even something. emptiness, like call emptiness, it emptiness. nothingness, uh, the void, the abyss. Um, and the course is, is not in that place. We all want to think it is, but the course is in a, a third stage where God is a real being, not with a form or limitation. He's infinite, but in the sense of having thoughts, having feelings, having intentions, having a will, having a plan, um, being creative. Knowing, knowing we're here. Knowing that we're here. And as a being, he's absolutely safe because he doesn't have any trace of the wrathful, punitive side of the traditional God, but he's just pure loving, purely loving, so loving that he doesn't even forgive because to forgive would imply that he held something against somebody. So he's past even having to forgive. Um, and I think that's a, that's a whole topic that... I know, and, and I love that topic, and I want to do a deep dive on it at some point. Maybe we can do that in a podcast at a later date. We have a few more questions, and yeah, we're okay. going to run over time a little bit, okay. but okay. hopefully that's okay. Everybody's home, so <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. might, you might have more time. Uh, Lynn says, if we remember the colossal guilt of the separation from God, how is it that the ego can tap into this state, or is it possible that having created the ego, we remind we're reminded in all of our living moments of the guilt of separation. This is confusing. I think the fact is, is that just because something is in the unconscious doesn't mean it doesn't affect us. It means it constantly affects us. It seeps up. It, it shapes and structures our conscious experience without being consciously remembered. So there, the, the unconscious is all about that paradox of something that's in there that's affecting us all the time without us being consciously aware of it. That's, that's what the unconscious is. So David says, is it accurate to think of fear as the author of the ego? I would think the ego is the author no, of fear. No, no. The ego is the author of fear and fear, it starts with attack. Separation from God is attack. And then it becomes guilt and then it becomes fear. We all would love to say and often try to say or do say that, well, it all started because I was just afraid. What can I say? And what the Course is saying, no, 
it started because you wanted to be above your brothers and above God, you attacked. And that's what led ultimately to you being afraid. So who likes that? No one wants it that way, but that's definitely the course's teaching. And I think it's very logical. Yeah, John is echoing what we were saying about traditional uh, versions of God. When he was raised as a Christian, we're taught that God is wrathful. How do we help others and our subconscious that may still have those thoughts to release those ideas? Isn't the whole Old Testament based in guilt and fear? I have Christian friends who really hold on to a God that punishes us. We've got to talk about this. Tomorrow. Yeah. And I would say, to be really fair, the Old Testament is full of a God who punishes and is into fear. And there's a lot of loving God in the Old Testament. And the New Testament is shot through with the wrathful God, too. So both Testaments have both sides. Um, that's, I just think, that needs to be said. Uh, I think Loving the, if you do as well. Well, yeah, but there's also a way in which he's just loving. I mean, the, the Bible is not a unified thing, or it's not even remotely a unified thing. You know, it's writings from centuries apart by different people. And, but I, what I would say is we have to, as course students, learn to relate to and to be grateful for and to love the vision of God and the God who is presented to us in the course and have a sense of satisfying, you know, fulfilling relationship with that God. I think as we can internalize that in ourselves, we can be a source of promoting that directly or indirectly in the world. And the world needs that vision of God. Yeah. I, yeah. We can only have that satisfying relationship with God though, if we're not inherently afraid of him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's what's so beautiful about the course's message to the world. Okay. Uh, Robert would like real world examples of this. Of? This whole process, the separation, guilt, fear cycle. <laughs> you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, some of this doesn't have a real world example in that the separation happened before there was a world. But how do you apply the teaching? How do you relate to it from your own experience? Well, I think the, to me, the upshot of this is just that, yeah, I'm aware of guilt, but I need to tell myself that A, it has no real basis, and B, there's an ulterior motive of the ego in there that I feel guilty, so I become afraid, so I act egotistically. Um, and so to me, this is a way to, you know, I'm aware of, there's guilt in my mind at all times over a variety of things. And this is a way to look at that and get a different perspective on it. So that's, that's kind of what this means to me. This is, this is course, bas basic course theory um, which the course will apply in different ways later on. But this bit of information today is just kind of laying down some theory and that's how I relate to it. Okay. Jackie says, this is deep spiritual truth. I love this in a world, in this world and this time that the ego has made. When I choose the ego, I do unloving behaviors. So is this realm in this realm, I really do get to make right those unloving behaviors rather than just saying, I'm not really guilty. Do you agree? Now, that's a good point. You, you can undo the unloving behaviors. You do have that opportunity in this world. Yeah. And I've been thinking a lot about, about you know, what I hear in that question from Jackie um, in the last day. And I think one thing the course is constantly doing is it's not just saying, just don't feel guilty. It's directing us to find the root of what we thought or did that made us feel guilty and undo that root of it. That's what we saw yesterday. Um, there's another passage from chapter four where he says, you know, when you feel guilty, know that the ego is in charge because only the ego can experience guilt. But he says, um, Leave, the, leave your sins to me, 
but I can't help you unless you forgive the people essentially that you attacked and feel guilty for. So he's constantly having us go to the cause of guilt and undo it there, rather than just keep that cause intact and say, I don't feel guilty because the Course says guilt is not a valid emotion. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And that's the real benefit of these discussions where you can look at your experience objectively and say, oh yeah, I'm in this cycle. And when you recognize yourself as being in a cycle, you have a better chance of getting out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And what puts us in this cycle is, I mean, all the attack and separation that is behind the guilt, the cause of the guilt. And we've got to go to there and undo that rather than keep that intact and just say, I won't feel guilty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll just throw this in before we go to Robert's question about real life experiences of this. I mean, I think we, we face them all day long. But one, one thing, in addition to recognizing that you're in the cycle, that's when you, you notice that you've, your peace has been disturbed. We're in this practice too. And then you, you apply your lesson for the day on top of it. So today ours is the ego and the Holy Spirit are the only choices which are open to me. And so when you talk about trying to uproot the source, one way to do that is just going to your practice line the moment you realize that your peace has been disturbed. Yeah. Yeah. And he actually wants us to go searching for the cause of our guilt. There's a couple of places in chapter five and chapter four that say, you know, look for it and undo the cause. So what, we're running just a little late. Yeah, here. we Sorry, are. Sorry, everybody. But <laughs> we're this, definitely this, running late. <laughs> this is good. So, so how do you, and I, I promise I'll, I'll close this here, but, but I think this is really practical. So how do you, how do you not just use a practice line to cover up whatever it is that you're feeling, but not get to the source of it and uproot it there? So how, how do you both use your practice line the way that we're told and really look at it so that you can, you can get it from, from the base? Well, that's, I think that's a kind of a large topic. But one thing I think to do is if your practice line is always being used to kind of justify and keep in place the ways you've been thinking about and behaving towards others, then you know something's not right. If it's okay. always about your magnificence and everything and, you know, it's never about undoing how you've been towards others, then something's not right. That's really good. That's, that's a really good way to look at it. Okay. All right. I feel like I can say more, but we should. Yeah, we should. <laughs> Susan we should. asks, will these meetings be available to listen to again and again? Yes, they are. You can find the recordings for all the text gatherings uh, at circle of aid forward slash text gathering. And we've also added them to the resources section of the circle of a site. So if, if you remember the URL, just go to circleofa.org and under resources, you'll see text gatherings. So thank you all for your kind comments. Thank you for joining us. Sorry to run over, but I hope you found that valuable. And we will see you here again tomorrow, same link. Bye for now. Bye.